Welcome to Queen Mary's Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. My name is Daniel Lee and I teach in the School of History here at Queen Mary. I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the director of the IHSS, Professor Simon Reed Henry, who is not able to be here today owing to travel restrictions. He's asked me to relay a couple of housekeeping matters about today's event. First, this is a blended event. We welcome our online and physical audience members alike and hope that you both feel fully a part of our discussion. Discussion and debate are at the heart of what the IHSS is about. If you're here in the room, please feel free and very welcome to pose your question using the microphones provided so that our audience at home can hear you. If you're watching online, you can also pose a question in the chat, which the chair for, the, for, the, for today, which I suppose is me and probably all of us, uh, will be keeping an eye on. And then second of, second of all, a few COVID related matters of importance for those who are present, please remember to keep at least one meters distance from each other, um, especially when you're seated and to follow <laughs> basic hygiene practices. Please also be very welcome to wear a face mask if you so wish. Please also alert us to your email if you have not signed up in advance for this event for track and trace purposes. Okay, the IHSS was established in 2018 to bring together scholars from across the faculty's eight schools to share ideas, develop research, and explore innovative approaches to scholarly and public problems alike. Every year, scholars work together exploring a different theme. The IHSS's annual theme this year is aftermaths, a particularly relevant topic for today's discussion. The IHSS is delighted to host the UK launch of Suzanne Schneider's The Apocalypse and the End of History, Modern Jihad and the Crisis of Liberalism, published with Versa. We're particularly grateful to Seth and Siska and the Middle East Research Centre at UCL's Institute for Advanced Studies for co-sponsoring. Writing about Suzanne's book, Faisal Devji, historian at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, wrote, and I quote, by attributing Islamic militancy neither to immediately political nor distantly theological cases, Suzanne Schneider's wonderfully lucid and convincing argument allows us to see it in anew as something both familiar and frightening in its ubiquity. The links she draws between the violent, apocalyptic, and nihilistic character of ISIS and the colonial origins of neoliberal practices make for a wholly original approach to the subject, end quote. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Yolanta for all of her support in making today's event possible. Verso is kindly offering a 40% discount to people who have registered for today's event. It now gives me great pleasure to formally introduce our guest speaker and our panel in the order that they will speak. Suzanne Schneider is De Deputy Director and Core Faculty at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research, working in the fields of history, religious studies, and political theory. She's the author of Mandatory, Mandatory Separation, Religion, Education, and Mass Politics in Palestine, published by Stanford in 2018. And her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, Mother Jones, N Plus One, and the LA Review of Books, among other outlets. The three respondents, Ahmed Delami, uh, we'll go first, who is a lecturer at the Exeter University in the history of modern Middle East. Ahmed writes on the relationship between religion, politics, and art in the Arab Peninsula and the Middle East. He's currently working on the contemporary Gulf. Oh, oh, sorry, he's currently working on a book on the contemporary Gulf, tentatively entitled, What is the Gulf? <laughs> <laughs> Conceptualizing history, order, and disorder in Arabia. Our second commentator is Martin Frampton, Professor of Modern History at Queen Mary University of London. He's the author of three books on the troubles in Northern Ireland, and has more recently completed a lengthy book on the history of the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and the West, published by Harvard University Press in 2018. He has also written on the contemporary challenges of counter-terrorism and counter-extremism, more significantly with the, with the 2009 pamphlet for policy exchange, Choosing Our Friends Wisely, Criteria for Engagement with, with Muslim Groups, and his 2016 paper, Unsettled Belonging, a survey of Britain's Muslim communities. Our third and final commentator is Julie Norman, lecturer in politics and IR at UCL. Julie's research lies at the intersection of human rights, security, and resistance in protracted conflicts, with a focus on the Middle East and North Africa. She's the author of the Palestinian Prisoners Movement, Disobedience and Resistance with Routledge 2021, and three books on unarmed resistance, 
including understanding nonviolence and the second Palestinian Intifada, civil resistance. She's also published on political detention, conflict and development, and critical approaches to preventing combating violent extremism. Her current research uses experimental methods to assess public opinion on political violence. So the format of today is as follows. Suzanne will present her new book, and this will be followed by comments from our three panelists. Suzanne will have a chance to respond to the comments before opening up to the questions from you, the audience. So Suzanne, welcome to the IHSS. The floor is yours. Hello, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming out in person. For those of you who are watching at home online, thank you for being here in digital form. Um, and again, thank you to Queen Mary for hosting us and the Middle East Research Center at UCL for helping make this event possible. And yes, to our incredible like tech and administrative team over here who has been working to make everything run smoothly. So it's an incredible honor to be able to uh, rope in smart people, essentially make them talk about your ideas. So thanks to uh, Martin and Ahmed and Julie for agreeing to join this conversation today. It's a delight to be here in person. And I just wanna also recognize all the work that Dan and Seth have done to make it happen. Okay, so I wanna say a little bit about why I wrote this book and how it came to assume the form that it did. It was nearly 20 years ago uh, that, or just, about, just over 20 years ago, that the attacks of 9-11 made jihad a household name in the West. It was an utterly strange and unfamiliar thing to many, and I think it was particularly a surreal thing to experience for people who are around my age. We had grown up in the 90s, at least in the US, during this period of kind of relative peace and prosperity, and suddenly it, it seemed as if the sky was falling. I, myself, I was a freshman in college in Manhattan at the time. Uh, newly arrived from South Dakota, and that knowing next, next to nothing about the Middle East or Islam, certainly nothing about the history of Afghanistan or American involvement in the region, nor did I know anything about the growing tide of Islamist politics or the internal shifts that had revolutionized the practice of jihad over the last several decades. People obviously wanted answers to explain the attacks, and soon a whole industry had grown up around this demand. There were academic takes mixed in that tried to offer greater nuance, but the dominant narrative quickly became something like this. Jihad is some strange relic of a barbaric past perpetrated by those who hate our freedom. This is consequently a clash of civilizations fought against another who is the utter negation of everything that the West represents. Now, just because these tropes are now tired and easily repudiated has not lessened their appeal. And it's still common to find commentators bemoaning the quote-unquote medieval quality of jihad or claiming that ISIS was intent on recreating the conditions of 7th century Arabia. This book is my attempt to intervene in this conversation and tell a different type of story, not about the barbarians of the age and how they are so unlike us, so to speak, but rather the ways in which today's jihad is a microcosm of global political and social trends that are remaking life in the West as well. Whether we look to the fetishization of individualism, the adoption of digital media to forge new types of global community, the embrace of governance as management, or the use of violence as spectacle, contemporary jihad reveals much of what is latent in the political and social order that we take for granted. In the end, I suggest then jihad and neoliberalism appear less like oppositional political projects than two, two sides of a single, very badly worn coin. Sorry, I'm losing my, losing my spot here. We can see these things then again, not as oppositional projects, but as phenomena that both eschew the political and society substantive contestation over what kinds of conditions should prevail in a given society, while also insisting that there's no alternative, at least not one that we can realize here on Earth. The line often attributed to Frederick Jameson that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism, I think should take on a different resonance when read alongside the Islamic State's fixation on the apocalypse, something that was notably absent among even an earlier wave of militant groups like Al Qaeda. So, too, I believe that the sort of violence that the Caliphate has embraced requires a contextual explanation rather than a merely theological one. Acts like executing aid workers or detonating a suicide vest at a pop concert are spectacular in the literal sense of the term, and yet yield little by way of material advantage. They are arguably even counterproductive in terms of wedding 
appetites in the West for military intervention. These acts of violence reflect a world in which human bodies are both interchangeable and disposable, props in the production of spectacle, means to an end that is itself illusory. I think it's quite puzzling to see people claiming that this type of violence is somehow deeply rooted in Sharia and not the logic of instrumentality that pervades modern capitalism. Okay, so having given you a very short version of the, the big argument, I want to briefly discuss the methodological approach I've taken in the book and how it enables us to ask a different set of questions than those that usually circulate regarding jihad. Many treatments, including scholarly ones, assume a line of continuity that links contemporary jihad with its earlier, with its earlier iterations as if it's kind of one long continuous chain. But even a cursory look at things should give us pause. Are we really to believe that a mass shooting like that perpetrated by Omar Mateen in 2016 in Orlando, Florida, is of the same essential nature as the declaration of jihad by the Ottoman Empire's chief jurist in 1914, to say nothing of declarations from the medieval or classical period? So beyond the nature of contemporary jihad, to which I will return in a moment, another question arises if we look at the frequency of jihad over the centuries, and in particular, the proliferation of militant groups in over these last few decades. That is, if the impetus to wage jihad, as certain partisans uh, insist, supposedly stems from certain verses in the Quran that have been available to Muslims for well over a millennium, well, why has this sort of militant activity only become a global phenomenon over the past half century? Similarly, Muslim apocalyptic literature has been available for many centuries. Why does the end of the world appeal to the present generation in a way that it didn't to those coming of age in 1800 and 1950? Why now, in short? If Islam is the problem, as we are often told, at least in the US, shouldn't it have always been the problem? Uh, with the annals of history testifying to a continuous chain of revolt against local rulers and attacks against the infidels, the fact that this is so not the case underscores the limitations of these sorts of theological explanations. Conversely, this should also drive us to think about what about the past several decades has proven so generative of far-right and reactionary movements worldwide. Indeed, far from representing an ever-present reality, the contemporary period is a unique one in Islamic history, characterized by the proliferation of militant and separatist groups in several regions. Over the last four decades, we've seen the emergence of Islamic Jihad in 1979, Al-Qaeda in 1988, Al-Shabaab, whose parent organization, the Islamic Courts Union, dates the late 90s, Boko Haram in 2002, and the Islamic State, of course, in addition to literally hundreds of lesser known groups. Um, in the book itself, I'm using data drawn from Stanford University's Mapping Militant Organizations Project, and you can go on and they will give you kind of uh, different maps of various like non-state actors and militant organizations that have emerged in the last 50 years and you can just see the proliferation of these starting in the 1990s in a way that is just truly remarkable uh, to know. So that is to say the empirical data points us to something important which is that this is not just the way that things have always been uh, and rather it points to this general trend that's visible across several regions. The relative quiet in the early years of post-colonial independence giving way to a dizzying array of militant groups, splinters, and rivals, many of which employ the rubric of jihad to justify their activities, right? In Pakistan, we have approximately 25 different military factions emerged since the late 1980s alone. In lieu of continuity, then, what we confront in the history of jihad is rupture. And I want to draw our attention to a transformation that's both elemental and yet strangely absent from most of the public discourse around the topic. Prior to the 20th century, jihad is widely regarded in Sunni Muslim legal literature as a tool of states and rulers, a form of warfare that Muslims are called to by a recognized political authority, not a form of vigilantism or terrorism that could be enacted on one's own. Within this schema, the idea of an ordinary Muslim declaring jihad was about as sensical as a French peasant declaring war on Prussia. Again, we need only contrast the declaration of jihad from the Ottoman Empire's chief jurist in consultation with the Sultan Caliph at the outset of World War I with Osama bin Laden's at the century's close to perceive that something fundamental in the theory or practice of jihad had occurred in the interim. Indeed, it was only during the latter half of the 20th century and within the context of widespread disillusionment with the post-colonial state that a new crop of ideologues emerged who viewed jihad as an insurgent tactic that could be deployed by individuals and groups against existing governments and leaders. 
breaking with the traditional cord that stressed obedience to those in authority, even if they were unjust, this new wave of thinkers, themselves more likely to be engineers than classically trained Islamic scholars, embraced jihad as the preeminent form of social activism. They took aim at Muslim political elites and the religious functionaries who legitimated their rule, forwarding the novel arguments that jihad was incumbent upon individuals qua individuals. So far from residing outside the history or the trajectory of liberalism, the, revolu the revolutionary use of jihad rests on the quasi-democratic assumptions that a ruler, in the words of Said Qutb, occupies his position only by the completely and absolutely free choice of all Muslims, and that likewise, oppressive leaders had no right to demand obedience. Likewise, a legal argument developed during these decades regarding jihad as far as I am, an individual obligation, the king's request fasting or prayer, or prayer rather than part of a collective obligation, akin to say burying the dead. Right? That this shift testifies much more, I think, to the ascendance of modern individualism than it does to the supposed stranglehold of the past on Islamic societies. The original target of such attacks in the early 1980s were Muslim leaders and state institutions like Egyptian President Anwar Sadat or the Syrian Ba'ath Party under the leadership of Hafez al-Assad. Moreover, the United States encouraged jihad's insurgent turn by aiding the so-called freedom fighters in Afghanistan in their battle against godless communism, seeing Islamic revival revivalism as an effective tool to restrain the left. Osama bin Laden was not just the most famous alumna of the Afghan jihad, but also a byproduct of this massive ideological shift. A man with no state to lead or credentials as a religious scholar could not have declared jihad on a country to say nothing of the world's great superpower even a half century earlier. Nor would he have had much luck reaching the Muslim masses prior to the age of cable news and online chat rooms. More recently, the Islamic State has mobilized the power of social media and messaging platforms to construct a network of true believers the world over. Creating a digital caliphate that is nowhere sovereign, but everywhere present. As these examples suggest, understanding contemporary jihad requires contending with the very modern, even liberal assumptions about the nature of political authority and individual responsibility that serve as its theoretical scaffolding on the one hand, and the technological advances that facilitate its operations on the other. So in sum, instead of looking backward in Islamic history for answers, contemporary jihad is far better analyzed by looking cross-culturally at the transformation of subjectivity, community, governance, and violence on a global scale. This, in a nutshell, is what I try to do in the book. In fact, there's a chapter on each one of those things. So there are a number of uh, specific examples or case studies that we could kind of that we could dwell on, but I think I'm going to stop here and perhaps we'll, we'll be able to take up some of them with our panel. Thank you. Uh, and then I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Suzanne. That was um, thank you for that introduction to the book, um, which I very much enjoyed. And um, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, I want to say, I don't know where to start my, with my questions or my comments, um, um, but I just want to, to, to begin by saying that the book does so many things and does them so, so well. Um, I, I don't know exactly where to begin with them. Uh, in, in some ways, for those of us trained in the tradition of the East as there is in the East history, um, the book responds to a, a kind of demand that we've always made, uh, to, uh, which ironically is to undo our field. Um, ironically, specialists in the Middle East are supposed to have this, uh, you know, uh, secret source knowledge that opens up the region that is distinct from the disciplinary activities of every other department and, and discipline. But um, here we are now producing work that basically says, you know, that's not true. What we need to do is to, is to uh, get rid of this idea that we need to have specialist uh, theological knowledge specifically in order to be able to decipher this problem. So uh, in, in some ways, the, the book is, is, a, um, is long overdue for the field and, and for that, it, it, that is in itself a huge achievement. Um, and yet, the, the I, I'm here, I'm, I want to sort of lead up to my, my question a little bit, but by, by saying a few words about the response to, to the, the phenomenon of uh, IS and ISIL, and how we're going to talk about it. Um, in, in some ways, the 
the Muslim response to IS itself uh, is indicative of the problem here, where you have, for the first time, maybe one of the first time, maybe not the first time, but quite uh, novel agglomerations of scholars coming together from all over the world, from Egypt, from Iran, from India, from Malaysia, from Egypt, coming together to say what Islam is and isn't in response to IS. And uh, in some ways, it falls into the trap that the, the Islamic State produces, right, for us all. Um, and in many ways, that that urge to pronounce on what Islam is and isn't by this global community of scholars is um, is anathema to an understanding of Islam that is capable of being contradictory, that is capable of being broad enough and historically capacious enough for us to not have to explain um, uh, a phenomenon like, that is really a product of the contemporary world, uh, just like we have uh, this kind of violence erupt in shopping malls and shootings that, we, that you talk about in the book um, so, so eloquently. Um, so, that is that has been one response to IS that 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 fails that fails miserably to, to be able to to, to uh, as a response at all, and then there's a, there's another um, but there's another historical consequence of IS that um, that I want to talk about briefly, and that is how um, Islamism became a liability rather than an asset for so many of the states of the region, and and um, and. And what emerges is that the critique of Islamism, which usually came from the left, now comes from the right in the Middle East. And so what your book also does is it gives us a language for understanding uh, conservatism as distinct from Islam, Islamism, essentially, um, which I find uh, extremely important and, uh, and a part of um, broadening the field of what we study in the Middle East uh, to uh, include things we like and we don't like, and the things that we don't like, we don't want to just explain them away. We, we can have, we're responsible for actually accounting for them in their, in their fullest extent. So my question is, um, I guess, what what if you were to achieve your goal, which is for the book to able to be, for us to be able to say, okay, well, you know, this this phenomenon is no longer a product of Islamic theology. We don't really look at it in this in this language. We want to look at it in in terms of uh, the an after effect of neoliberalism, of capitalism, of nihilism, and all the uh, national hypernationalism. Um, what new questions are we going to ask uh, if you if you were to achieve those things? What what is what is um, what remains uh, in for us in the field to be able to account for, uh, aside from that, uh, that that debunking, you know? Um, that's my that's my first question. I'll move on. I'll allow somebody else to say that. Okay, well, um, like everyone else, I'm delighted to be able to participate in this event. Uh, I was introduced to uh, Suzanne through Daniel last year uh, amidst the depths of the pandemic and lockdown, uh, when my increasingly monotonous daily trip out with my sons to the same park at the same time every single day uh, was enlivened by a phone conversation uh, with Suzanne about her work, which was stimulating and inspiring equal measure. And subsequently, Suzanne sent me the draft of the manuscript of the book, which again, I found deeply compelling. And being completely useless, I failed to deliver any feedback to her. So I'm especially <laughs> delighted to be able to kind of uh, salve my conscience and help me to launch this book. Um, not that I could have really added, I think, much that was useful uh, to her, because this is a wonderfully eloquent book, uh, which is now uh, materialized at remarkable speed um, with the rest of us to shame with our uh, storm research projects. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful to be on this panel. And so is the book and its arguments, which I devoured in its current form in virtually a single sitting, um, which is a testament to how beautifully written it is and how thought-provoking I think the, the ideas within it are. 
as it's been alluded to. And in this book, we're presented with a panorama of events at times unlikely from Kim Kardashian's California mansion, the execrable fiction of Christian survivalist Mark Goodman, who look at that book is there in the book. From MMA, MMA gyms to the endeavors of private military contractors like the executive outcomes of Blackwater, and from the brutalities of Islamic State to the infographics and statistical readouts of the Glencore Trading and Mining Company. So, across the book, it's really an extended attempt to grapple, as has been said, with big ideas. It packs a lot into its 240 odd pages. And I'm not going to try and reflect on everything that's uh, there, it's certainly not my job. Um, I don't want to spoil it for you because I would definitely encourage you to, to go out and buy it. As Dan has said, it's a very, very reasonable discount price for the tool um, offer from publishers. Um, but I thought I might dwell for a moment on four key takeaways that I took from the book and then also take the opportunity to kind of pose a couple of questions, things that I wanted to kind of hear more from Suzanne about and maybe ask her to flesh out right this a bit more. So, the first, so first, then, to my four takeaways. Well, the first of these is, is really been emphasized, I think, by Susanna and Ahmed in the comments, which is what this book stresses is the very novelty of jihadism as a form of violence, a form of violence shaped with reference to Islam, but radically innovative in its application of Islamic concepts. Um, and in this, I was recently uh, with my MA students, so if it's number here or listening, um, I hear the echo of Mark Bloch's critical injunction that a historical phenomenon can never be understood apart from this moment in time. And I think you underline this very effectively, um, as you mentioned, by showing how, whereas jihad was classically seen as a function of the state, now it has been unmoored and is located with the individual for whom it offers meaning, identity, and a sense of agency. This leads on to the second point, the degree to which jihadism embodies the fragmentation of the state, the collapse of traditional modes of authority, both religious and political, and that challenge has proven very difficult to cope with for not least for the reasons Ahmed has just mentioned. In the hands of the individual, jihad takes on the features of an ethical act, an idea first suggested by Faisal Deji, with whose work I know that stands closely engaged. Very difficult to do this on a stool. Um, the third point uh, is decoupling from the state. Uh, jihad replicates the privatization of violence that is the defining feature of our age. Uh, the passages, passages of the book we read across from Islamic State to say Blackwater or Dancor, I think are especially striking, not because, as Suzanne says, they're identical, but because it's symptomatic of the erosion of the variant state in our current moment. And fourthly, and most importantly, then, the book sees jihadism as a vehicle for understanding key aspects of modernity. It reflects contemporary visions of and debates about identity, agency, subjectivity, and governments. And in this sense, jihadists are, to borrow a phrase, from another scholar whose work I think has again influenced Suzanne Roxanne Newman, uh, they are the enemy in the mirror. They're a symptom of a world shaped by neoliberalism, <coughs> itself understood as a doctrine prefigured, Suzanne's quote, in the colonial world. So I think it's a fascinating way of approaching the subject. It raises a lot of crucial issues and asks a lot of important questions. It's with that in mind that I will then try and raise a couple of points where I'd love to hear Suzanne say a bit more. So the first is rather short, um, but in thinking about how we define the modernity uh, in which we live, the temporal and spatial world, which as you described, we share with jihadists, I wonder how you might extend your description of it beyond the epithet of neoliberalism. And I was interested in your use in the book of the word hypermodern at various points, and I, I just want to say a bit more about what you took that to mean. Uh, oh, and uh, related to that, I wonder again about questions of secularity and the relationship of secularism to both modernity and jihad themes that you touch on in passing. But again, I'd be interested to hear a bit more about. The second issue um, I was intrigued by was your discussion of the nature of jihadist violence. And I was particularly struck by your use of the word uh, nihilistic to describe this. And it's very provocative, very. Um, an argument that sees this nihilism as reflective of a failure of political imagination, which again is symptomatic of the neoliberal world in which we live. And I wondered, just to pose a counter note, if you like, that is this not to too readily dismiss the politics of the movement? Doubtless, ISIS's uh, Islamic State's dreams could be described as, as we do, as described as fanciful or reflecting the illusions of grandeur. But I wonder, are they any less 
uh, political fallout. And I'm reminded here of that former scholarly life of mine when uh, thinking about the troubles in Northern Ireland. One of the best books about the troubles in Northern Ireland is, is a work by uh, a scholar Henry Patterson, whose book is called The Politics of Illusion, and which illuminates the extent to which the IRA was sustained through a campaign, a long, long campaign, by its own set of delusions as the possible. Indeed, no less delusional were its objectives for the fact that they were articulated in terms perhaps more recognisable to Western ears than those of Islamic State. And as Patterson notes in that book, and others have done likewise, it's crucial, therefore, to not ignore the politics and to try and identify the strategic outlook and the politics of these movements to take its political thought seriously. Because for Islamic State there was a political vision and an idealization of a distinct social political order, which again I acknowledge in the book, and the remarkable things that it was brought into existence, at least for a short period. And in regards to the kind of attacks that you, you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, Suzanne, in terms of uh, attacks that we've seen in France, Belgium, the UK from 2015 through 2017 and down to the present, it is, I think, possible to detect a strategic ambition. And again, I think you do kind of implicitly acknowledge this, uh, an ambition to sow to sort of discord, and to drive a wedge between Muslims and non-Muslims, wherever that's possible. And in a sense, there is a similarity in this with the original Al-Qaeda strategy in Iraq, uh, patented by the likes of Russell Zakawi, who talked of a desire to entrench sectarianism as a strategic option in order to uh, unite what he saw as true Muslims, like Sunni, uh, behind Al-Qaeda, and uh, to divide them from the heretics, the Shia, and the infidel, the US occupiers. And to achieve this, he unleashed a wave of violence, particularly in terms of mass suicide bombings that devastated Iraq from 2003, uh, certainly down to 2007 in particular, but continued thereafter. Hundreds of people killed in individual attacks. Attacks that could be read as nihilistic and, and were by many, but which I would suggest are actually informed by a cold, relentless strategic logic. And it was that same logic which arguably shaped the practice of Islamic State as it waxed and waned. In its latter day, more weakened state, it has perhaps reverted to be more like its predecessor, Al Qaeda, in the post 2001 world an individualized global movement, the kind of movement in which there are no foot soldiers, actually, but rather everyone is permitted to imagine himself as the chief of staff, uh, free to project their own strategic goals and ambitions into the silent tactics as they see fit. And we get a sense of this if we hear the words of people like Mohammed Sadiq Khan, leader of the London Bombers in 2005, he effectively arrogates to himself the right to acting as both generalissimo and frontline fighter at one at the same time. To my second point, so I was a bit wrong. Third and finally, um, there's the issue of possible futures. And in your final pages, uh, you turn to the question of how to build an alternative to neoliberalism. And you urge us to rethink ideas of security and sovereignty. And I just wonder what your assessment is today as to the state of the neoliberal world. Um, and is there other any grounds for thinking it's perhaps more fragile than ever previously? Um, your description of Iraq as a neoliberal candy land. Uh, very striking again, uh, but it reminded me of an excellent article by a former colleague here at Queen Mary, Toby Dodge, who described how uh, American neoliberal dreams were like, described as kind of buried by the sands of reality in Iraq. So paraphrasing there. Um, and how the US was forced, in a sense, to abandon many of its neoliberal prescriptions because of reality, if you like, in Iraq. And more recently, of course, we've had the experience of the pandemic, which has been begun to be read by some people as an indictment of the neoliberal state. Uh, and you could even say that the kind of rhetoric and policies emerging from governments on both sides of the Atlantic is suggestive of a, 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 an impulse for saying that the state is back and, and it reflects a kind of departure from the neoliberal consensus of the previous three decades. So I wondered what your sense of that was, are, you, are we to think an inflection point? And what do you set, suspect will come next? So those are just some of my responses to the book. Um, but I'll again but end by uh, thanking Suzanne for opening the conversation and I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say in the comments of our wonderful panelists. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Well, I'll echo the other panelists and uh, first just thanking Queen Mary for hosting the event and congratulating uh, Suzanne on the book. Um, very timely, very original, very provocative, and uh, as others have said, a very interesting read. Um, 
I think it's interesting, the book rightly situates jihad in broader trends of modernity and also of political violence, which, which is what I work on and study. And also, I really appreciate the historical approach that Sunan takes to analyze this, um, not only taking jihad out of the seventh century Islamic world kind of context, but also out of the what just happened after the Iraq war context as well. So again, in political science, we focus on kind of the hyper recent. So the Iraq war, um, things have happened in the last five to 10 years to explain these trends. And Suzanne finds a nice middle ground with looking at 20th century, um, a bit, bit broader arc. And uh, I appreciate that. Um, as I said, I was particularly interested in how Suzanne describes how jihad maps onto other forms of political violence and how those how that has just changed in general recently from the non-state nature of violence that we see more with militias or with the privatized violence. Um, and for me, though, I found what she was saying about what causes uh, um, radicalization or extremism um, was very interesting. I've worked a lot with former combatants uh, from both jihadi backgrounds as well as uh, right-wing uh, extremists or white nationalist extremists in the US. And I found a lot of insights very relevant. So on one point, uh, Suzanne writes, jihad offers the apparition of personal agency amid an ever-growing sense of collective futility. So I'll just say that again, an apparition of personal agency amid an ever-growing sense of collective futility. And so while I think this helps us contextualize jihad, I think it helps us contextualize violent extremism as it's manifesting across many ideologies today. Um, I'm reminded of a comment by um, a former white nationalist from the US who I spoke with who says, you know, I think ultimately people become extremists, not necessarily because of the ideology, the ideology is simply the vehicle to be violent. And I think I've seen this a lot in my work as well. Um, Islam or any ideology tends to be quite secondary. It's often described as the packaging that ends up convincing one to join an extremist group or sometimes a violent extremist group. It's a conduit, if you will, that legitimizes other grievances. And that can be, again, a jihadi background, a right-wing background, any other kind of ideology. So this is something that I look at a lot in my work, and I found it very interesting in how Suzanne um, engages with it here. I'll be honest that I usually look at more the individual level. Um, we're interested in how recruiters tap into that sense of futility, which tends to be very different for different people. Some it's uh, you know, a family issue, some it's an economic issue, some it's something else. Um, whereas Suzanne really grounds in this macro concept, which, which pushes me in an interesting way to think about that a little bit more. Um, and, uh, and kind of going on the hyper-personal and hyper-local, which, which I'm usually focused at. Um, so I'll, I'll go into some of my questions though. And uh, again, as others have said, this is a book that encapsulates a lot within it. And I would say that Jihad itself is a pretty big category in the book. Um, I think, you know, Suzanne, you do a great job of showing how Jihad as a concept has changed over time. Um, but I, I was curious to unpack it a little bit more in the post 9-11 context. Like to me, sometimes the book seems to be speaking directly to ISIS, um, but even that, I think we could say which ISIS at this point, like, you know, the kind of ISIS 1.0 or others, um, much less Al-Qaeda, Lone Wolves, there's, I think, one reference to Hamas. I'm, I'm just curious of how you kind of are defining jihad, because I guess my sense is modern jihad is very varied, and especially with how it engages with some of the themes in the book, like the state and governance, or violence, or spectacle, or community. So if you could say a bit more about that. Um, the other thing I was curious about is just as jihad is a big category, neoliberalism is also a very, I would say, broad stroke kind of category in the book as well. And you engage with it in many different facets, um, governance, violence, capitalism, populism. And I'm wondering if, if one stands out more to you than others, and if any of those facets were maybe a harder fit than others. Um, again, to me, I definitely see the parallels with violence. I would maybe push you push back a little bit on the parallels between say ISIS and something like Glencore or corporate model. I, I can see some of the similarities, but I could also say um, we can see a lot of the same organizational structures and slick packaging of like NGOs that I'm sure a lot of us support as well. So it, um, how do you kind of draw it down to, to being the corporate level? Um, and at one point you even write civic paralysis is the goal rather than the byproduct of neoliberalism. And 
I, I would maybe push a little bit on that. And is that something that, that we would take as, as a given or not? And unless, especially to the extent we can, can, um, can kind of tie it with, with Jihad. And on that note, my last question would be, um, I know this book I think was written for a pretty broad audience, but I'm wondering who exactly you're trying to convince in some ways, like ideally who you would try and convince. Like for me, the book, um, it, I think it speaks to readers who are coming at it with a progressive worldview already and kind of assumes a, a progressive reader, which you many in this group would, would probably subscribe to. But I'm wondering if you would frame your argument differently if speaking to a, a Trump voter or even a, a moderate or even liberal who does not issue um, capitalism or neoliberalism as a given. So, but overall, really interesting book, raised some really interesting ideas and questions for me. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. So I'm not going to ask you to try and explain to a Trump voter now uh, <laughs> the, the argument in your book, but perhaps you might take, um, if we take a few minutes just to respond to what we've heard yeah. so far. Is that okay before we open up? Yeah, sure. Um, these are like a, a, a huge range of wonderful kind of questions and comments, and, uh, and I really appreciate the kind of closeness of reading. Um, that kind of obviously went into preparing these remarks. So thank you, uh, thank you to all of you. Um, I'm just going to try to go down the line, I suppose, <laughs> because that's the only way I can keep track of it all. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, Ahmed, I was very struck at kind of what you, you said uh, about the kind of, you know, responses within the kind of like Muslim community to the kind of ISIS phenomenon and how the right, the mobilization of that kind of like traditionalist network of scholars that we like saw in something like the, the letter to Baghdadi, which I, I spoke about in the book, right, is completely counterproductive mm -hmm. because it falls, you know, precisely, yes, into these two traps. One, that there is a kind of singular phenomenon called Islam, as opposed to just like many Muslims, right, that it is as an abstract entity that can be defined in those the singular terms, which is the kind of, right, the, the, the mirror side of, of what the Islamic State kind of uh, advances as well. Um, and right, and second, that kind of mobilized like appeals to the like expertise and elite training of a class that has largely lost its legitimacy doesn't work in this kind of like right populist environment, which is how I think that we should understand um, kind of you know some of these attacks on kind of the traditions of jurisprudence and the ulama that kind of come out of uh, of, of the kind of like jihadi and particularly the Islamic State circles. So yeah, I think it's a, a wonderful point. It's just it can't do the work that you know it, it wants to do because we've already because the types of expertise and authority that it wants to mobilize have already disintegrated. They are they're 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 you know genuinely kind of under threat, if not completely absent under the instances. I'm gonna come back to the what is my goal kind of question in a second when I get in response to something that Martin Martin brought up. The Hyper modernity versus neoliberalism. Um, I mean, you have a bunch of questions here about kind of neoliberalism. So maybe I should just take a step back and say what I think neoliberalism is <laughs> and um, what I think is a useful concept here in the book. So, right, neoliberalism is often thought about as the or uh, as 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 a kind of retraction of the state or the state pulling back from the from from areas of human life where it was kind of most active. Um, I don't actually think that that's true. I don't think the neoliberal state has ever existed in a way that it claims. Actually, what happens in kind of following global theorists like Phil Morawski, I would can be characterized as a state capture and reemployment. So it's not that we're pulling back from the state. It's actually the, the point is to capture the state apparatus, the state capacities, and then make the state intervene in specific ways. So the state, I'm American, right in 2008, we saw massive state intervention. So the state is able to intervene for the sake of, say, propping up the financial markets. The state is not able to intervene to make sure that millions of Americans have like regular access to a doctor, right? And that the co and that there is something that happens here, where as the state, as state capacity kind of recedes in, um, in in terms of providing for some sort of general welfare, the state also becomes more coercive because it doesn't have the same legitimacy that it used to, and the question is then how states are going to respond to that legitimation crisis comes up. And so I don't think it's like coincidental that we have this kind of mass explosion of prison building and mass incarceration, right? That prisons and um, incarceration become a way of generating, of, of solving almost every social problem that is generated by this kind of retraction of the state from certain areas. So again, it's not that the state pulls back, it's that the state is redeployed 
Um, certainly the kind of, again, like the repressive capacities and capacities for state violence only increase under, under neoliberals and they certainly do not, um, do not pull back. Um, so that is the kind of first step. But yes, like Martin, is, is, as you mentioned, right, we seem to be on the cusp of something new. <laughs> We're not sure what exactly it is, but I think um, not just the financial crisis, but really the pandemic, right? The pandemic is a disaster for this kind of theoretical mode of governance, which, which would assume that you can solve as many problems as possible by taking them out of the political realm and instead subjecting them to the kind of problem solving functions of the market. So education can be privatized, or healthcare can be privatized, everything the market can presumably do more efficiently and better. And we don't need to have any sort of like central planning or kind of um, concerted effort in a, in, a, in a dedicated way. And this is what the United States tried to do for the first several months of the pandemic. And Jared Kushner was like, I'm gonna get my friends from the private sector, we're going to solve this problem. And we, uh, not having some sort of concerted, um, like centralized government response, is, is again, it is probably the worst thing you can do when you're trying to deal with something that at the level of a pandemic or say climate change or very, and in any number of these crises, there really are systemic and are so much larger than individuals or individuals ability to, 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 to affect them. So yes, I do think that we're kind of, um, we're headed, you know, that the, the state is back in this real way, but it's kind of the question as to what, is what kind of state is it going to be? Because the social destabilization is already here. Like the, what I would read these, uh, you know, even in the kind of US context, Julie, that, you know, you have mentioned, I've worked on this too, a number of these kind of like militia splinter and like white nationalist groups, right, also emerged during this period. And if you listen to what some of them say, um, they say like, you know, I, uh, this is a quote from someone who is uh, one of the leaders of the Capitol, uh, the Capitol Hill insurrection was, if we can't get the state that we deserve through normal means, then we have to try something else. So it's not that they've given up on the state, but now that they're trying, they're looking for a, a authoritarian alternatives. Maybe the military will run things better, right? Maybe our, uh, uh, this, a, a strong man can kind of make like bureaucracy great again. Like there's, um, so I think that the socially destabilizing effects of neoliberalism are, 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 are here to stay, even while there is now a sense that maybe we need the state. Um, and where that's going to lead us, I'm not entirely certain. But on the kind of you know question of the hyper modernity, right? And something like the you know like I speak for instance in the book about like the way that the Islamic State uh, thinks about or approaches community. And where is the where is the ummah? Where is the kind of local community of the Islamic State? Um, and it's in some ways that they're borrowing from the language of nationalism, they're borrowing from kind of exclusionary practices, they're certainly borrowing from like ethnic cleansing that we've seen in the region over the last hundred years, right? This all looks kind of very familiar, but on the other hand, their model, um, I mean, certainly now, but even when they're, um, even kind of as argued during their kind of the days of territorial sovereignty, right? Their model is, is, is also gesturing at something ahead. It looks it looks to me much more like the kind of global fan club or like corporate model. That's why I think a corporation actually is quite still useful when you think about we are based here and we have offices in these places. Like we have our branches all over the place that you know report back to our kind of central operations. Um, that structure, it is identity and it is belonging beyond territory, beyond the nation state. The nation state it kind of so decoupling political identity from the nation state itself is something that we see in this Islamic state mode of community. And I do think that that is different and that's new, it's not the nation state. So for me, it looks much more like a kind of corporate model or even like an online fan club or something like that. Um, and, and yes, I would say that that is kind of like hyper-modern um, in, in some way. The nihilism question is a really interesting one and definitely one that I feel like, uh, you know, I, I get some kind of pushback on, which, I, which is good. And I think it's like really productive to kind of to have it out. Um, and, and, and I think actually, Julia, I'll, I'll say this too, because this references something that you're talking about, right? As much as this book has a lot in it about kind of the broader history of jihad, right? It is a close study of the Islamic State. I say that throughout, those are my sources. It says, on, 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 you know, on, on, in all the descriptions, like I'm not claiming that the things I'm saying here apply to the Taliban or Al Qaeda even, or other organizations that kind of also, right, there's literally hundreds of them um, that kind of, uh, kind of have the mantle of jihad. 
Um, and that like I so and I think the Islamic State is really different than a group like the Taliban that has it is that looks looks much more like a reactionary version of an anti-colonial like revolutionary group to me um, than what the Islamic State actually was. And so I, I kind of do think that the nihilism here is you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of I'm a little bit attached to it for a few reasons. Okay, so on the one hand, think about the recency of suicide bombing as a tactic. Right, this only within the last like 40 years. And even if you think about the like uh, during the the Afghan Mujahideen who were fighting the Soviet against the Soviet Union in the 1980s, they skewed this tactic. They did not want anything to do with this tactic because it's so theoretically and theologically dicey. Um, and it has become like moved front and center and has been theologically remade as the like the, the, the apex of one's life is the kind of this pursuit of death. Um, right where there's all these stories in the Islamic State media about right about people who are seeking their deaths right they're praying for their deaths. This is not like something that we have going back centuries or millennia of a, of a, of a model. Right? You, the death is a possibility, certainly, right? For the for uh, what and, and martyrs should be honored, but you're not necessarily you know, seeking your own death um, in this way. And so too, the you know kind of question is to like. I, I think you're right that there's certainly like psychological damage that is uh, that that is uh, that, that is performed by you know some of these attacks, certainly in the West, or even some of these like you know execution videos. Um, and that there is a kind of material, you can say that there's a strategic goal in terms of trying to, you know, yes, drive a wedge between kind of uh, like Muslim communities and kind of their, 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 their kind of broader societies in the West. But the thing is, it's, they're not actually, they're not actually able to do the thing they promised to do. Right, the functioning caliphate is no closer as a result of these things, and I don't think that it's. I don't. I don't think it's around the corner. Um, uh, I think that there, and you see this even now in the case of like Afghanistan, where the Islamic State is launching attacks against kind of Taliban or against departing troops. Right, they can be a thorn in the side. They can generate like they can generate views and likes and shares and and have a, a big like, kind of robust chat on, on on social media, but they're quite weak. They're not territorially like rooted. They're not culturally. They don't like really culturally belong to the place. They're certainly no match for for the Taliban. Um, so what they're able to do chiefly is to inflict harm. Um, you want me to want me to stop talking? About <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that uh, we, might, we might have a chance to open up. Okay, just then. one more, one, one, one more quick thing. Anyway, okay, so I can say more, Martin, but I, I'm gonna just cut, I'm gonna cut, I'm, I'm gonna cut you off because I'm getting cut off. Um, the and Julie, um, finally, um, the neoliberalism thing. Yes, NGOs are also neoliberal. That, that is absolutely the model. There, there, and and I do think that the um, the deep. I mean. There's been really actually great work about this, thinking about NGOs in Palestine, for instance, where the, the myth that one can have like economic development, right? Or we can have like women's advancement. We can have these things without having to solve any fundamental global problems about sovereignty and about territory, right? So that is an example of this kind of depoliticization that I think is pervasive within neoliberalism. And yes, is a goal, again, going back to this idea that we can solve as many problems as possible outside of the global realm and through the kind of the mechanisms of the market. Um, the, I mean, and, and yeah, who am I trying to convince? I don't know. I just had this book in my head. I had to get it out. Um, I don't know if anyone will be convinced, but, um, you know, hopefully maybe some will, maybe, maybe some will, but yes, it's certainly written from kind of a, a, a left perspective, uh, because I thought about it for a long time and I think that's the thing that makes sense. I don't know. Anyway, I'll stop here. <laughs> I'm sure perhaps we can come back um, to some of your final thoughts in a minute. Does anybody in the room have a question. People uh, watching from home, do feel free to start typing in the chat. We can thank you, Yolanda, for putting in that. In. We, we can see your questions here, so do please feel free to start. So I'll start with Kim over here. I, I think it's we might have to use the mic so that everybody at home can hear. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting discussion. I haven't read the book, but it's a nice starting point. It's okay. Yeah, there's, no, there's, there's no quiz. It's okay. No. <laughs> um, and I do appreciate uh, sort of taking on sort of the sort of medieval mindset and um, sort of what was often applied of the terrorists and all that. But I, I was wondering whether 
maybe ask, you know, where does uh, imperialism and its modern iterations come into play uh, if we see this as a not just things that happen in the back, but a response to very real global mm -hmm. change, which then brings in, and you mentioned that type of global resistance, there is uh, quite a long history of, of uh, the implication of, of, of the tropes and frameworks in anti global resistance uh, the 19th century, the Northwest frontier, Philippines, uh, Russia, Indonesia, these kind of places. And I'm just wondering whether, so focusing on the your, your present system approach, which I think is, is very compelling, but at the same time, doesn't really leave much room for a, I guess, a, a heavy medium place. So we don't need to go back uh, to sort of crusades, this construction of, of Islamist evil. Yet at the same time, you know, where where are the historical continuities? Mm -hmm. Right, but the, 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 the Western construction of the fanatic uh, is, is the Muslim. This is not new. It's not recent. Nor suicide attacks ascribe to a particular Islamic mindset. But just you know, do we need to go a bit back in time? Um, and yeah, I guess that's fair. Is it okay if we collect? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much uh, to Suzanne and all the panelists. This is a disciplinary question, actually, for all of you. Because I'm curious, you're about 20 years after 9 11, I'm curious if you could maybe reflect on how you sense the discipline of the study of Greece history, how you change as a result of the kind of question that this is asking in the book. And do you think that it is? Do uh, you think that scholars have met the point in a responsible way? Anybody else on the other side have any questions on that one? Right, so, Suzanne, let's oh. start with you and then we'll pass. I mean, right, like I am trained as a historian, so far be it for me to saying that we don't want to look backward. Um, but there, and, and, and perhaps I've kind of overcompensated for the tendency to write to narrate this as, as one long chain. But even the kind of examples that you mentioned from the 19th century, we, we have a, a small handful of them. It looks nothing like this kind of like proliferation of actors in multiple regions that we have starting in really the 1980s and then into the 1990s. Um, and so, but right, certainly the kind of mobile, like the Northwestern frontier, like using the language of jihad that you saw as a kind of a, 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 against a, a perceived occupier, right? Yes, there's absolutely kind of, you know, parallels to this, right? This happened, this isn't like this is the first time it happens in the, um, in the, in, in the, in the late 20th century or in the kind of Iraq war context, but why it's happening in so many different places at the same time right now is kind of my, you know, that, that is a historical conundrum, right? And that I don't believe we can kind of just narrate as um, um, as a kind of, you know, a piece of this long history. And also, I mean, the, the, the imperialism thing is, 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 is central, of course. So, right, you have, if you, um, you know, look at these like militant maps, you can see very clearly the ways in which the kind of proliferation of these militant groups uh, tracks civil wars. So post, you know, in Syria, in Iraq, um, but even in, you know, in, in, in many, also in Afghanistan and Pakistan, kind of in the kind of groups that originated in the kind of fight over Kashmir, but now kind of we've been, you know, redeployed internally uh, in Pakistan, for instance. So it's, the civil war piece is huge. The imperialism piece, right, the post-American invasion of Iraq is huge, but that's not the entire picture here because much of what mobilizes this is a kind of, it's not just a revolt against the kind of foreign occupiers. It's a, it's a rejection of established forms of political leadership, uh, established forms of religious authority. Um, it's attack again on Muslim leaders, right? The very kind of novel uh, theological arguments being put forth about how one can declare jihad on a Muslim ruler. That itself is, right, you can have a rebellion. There's the Islamic kind of juridical literature is full of, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion on, on rebellion, but it's not called the jihad. Um, and so even the application of that term as being, you know, the jihad against the the, the tawazit or the tazut, the kind of the, you know, the kind of the tyrants or the idols, literally this is a term that means idols or is associated with idolatry. 
in the Quran that in jihadi kind of language they'll use to talk about various regimes in the Middle East uh, in the region that are right that, are, that, that they, they that they because they elevate themselves essentially above others they are acting um, like almost this kind of quasi divine or godlike. Um, so all of that is kind of, I think, quite new and testifies again to this kind of collapse of political and religious authority um, that we've seen over the last, you know, hundred years, especially, and much and much of it not much of it actually coming from a kind of a, a liberal critique of those, you know, of religious authority of of kind of political authority, um, and and that's why I kind of insisted that kind of this story is one that's actually embedded in the history of liberalism and not something that's kind of outside of it. Oh, Seth asked something, but you guys can all talk about that. Well, I will definitely circle back to Seth's uh, question yeah. in a moment, but I'm just going to read a couple of questions yes. that people have typed from Hope, so you catch your breath. Okay. Pastor so, Honor. Yeah, feel free to is, pass is, the is, it, is it my mother? <laughs> I don't know if she's here. <laughs> the first question is from Winona, who asks, has the term jihad taken out of context from its historical terminology? And do you think we can go back to a more pacified perception of jihad? since it has been pro projected by imperialism and politics. I haven't read the book yet. And the other question is from Leila, uh, Leila McGurk. Could you touch on the importance historical materialism played theoretically in your approaches to this book? We briefly touched on this earlier in this talk when you mentioned how you reject the chronological development of what you've heard. Um, I guess like the short story is that no, I don't think it's hard to kind of ever go back to like, earlier iterations of the way words were used. Um, uh, and, and certainly, right, scholars who are kind of have worked on this question have kind of pointed out the, the various kind of etymological meanings of the word jihad, you know, kind of the, it's not necessarily <laughs> involved with a, a kind of practice of violence at all. Right, because it's a kind of uh, in legal literature, this is a question of the greater and the lesser jihad, right? All of this is, is present. I don't really want to get into it. But, you know, if you think about jihad as just a, a, a struggle, which is a kind of real etymology in Arabic, all right, you have people who use this in, 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 in all sorts of ways, which I, I, I welcome and I think are kind of creative. So, like in the US, uh, kind of Imama uh, Amina Wadud will talk about gender jihad. All right, that this is her push for gender equality in Islam. It's a, you know, obviously being very provocative, but I find that interesting the way that she is kind of reclaiming that term um, as well. Um, and as for Layla's question on, uh, yes, I am a historical materialist. I think you know that, Layla. <laughs> and generally, I think that we have to be attentive to the ways in which uh, uh, ideological um, uh, concepts are in conversation, not that, not that they directly stem from material conditions, but that they're in conversation with those material conditions. Um, uh, and, 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 you, and you see that with, you know, all of the place in, 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 in this study, I think. So, you know, you have old ideological concepts, um, you know, older religious concepts, something like takfir or something, uh, which is like excommunication or al-wala al bara which is like loyalty and disavowal. These are things that have been present within uh, kind of Islamic legal and social corpus for many years, but they're used and mobilized in entirely new ways, you know, since the 1980s and since the 1990s. So it's not that these kind of the concepts come out of nowhere, but understanding how and why they're mobilized in certain ways at certain times or why certain ideas which have been in circulation for a long time suddenly have purchased them sometimes and not others. Those are questions I think that are most productively um, answered kind of vis-a-vis -vis these material shifts. And again, we want to be, yes, we don't want to be vulgar Marxists, as they say, right? We want to be much more like uh, attentive to the ways in which ideology and materiality kind of have this kind of dialectical relationship and inform one another and kind of, yeah. Should we uh, maybe yeah. use? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. We'll come back to that. Any or anything else? else? Yeah. Well, I'm, I, well, there you go. Well, I, I don't, I have, I'm just thinking through Seth's question a little bit. About, <laughs> Um, you know, not, you know, the field's response to IS and the challenges it's posed uh, to, to, to research and to, to how to deal with this. And, and no, I think the answer is no, the, the response hasn't been uh, great for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think the knee jerk response was to, was to uh, emulate or to repeat what the field has done, which is to sort of want to explain it quickly so as to sequester it and like explain it away. Explaining and explaining away in the field of Middle Eastern studies have been almost synonymous. 
um, for a very, very long time. And I think that there's, um, whether we want to root it in, um, in, in, in sort of a, a capitalist dislocation, neoliberalism, or, uh, or whether we want to locate it in, uh, in the genealogy of anti-colonial resistance, or we want to locate it in Islamic theology, or we want to locate it in a specific thing. I think there's where we fall into traps. And one of the things that it does well is that it has a more, it includes things like nihilism, it includes things like, you know, the wars of the last 13 years, specifically the last 20, 15 years. Yeah. Um, I think uh, in that sense, it, it is, uh, it is a for it. I want to ask, I guess, in response is, what is it that's so offensive about violence that requires so much explanation? If the actual amount of violence does not actually uh, compare differently to what happened in the 18th or the 19th. You know, what is so offensive about this? I mean, this is, I guess, the question we should be asking ourselves in the field, and which allows us to then see our own assumptions, usually quite liberal, about violence um, that, that uh, needs to be. Yeah, I, I don't have anything that's saying profound. Um, as a response as that. Um, I speak as someone not within the field of Middle Eastern studies uh, as a historian of the Middle East per se. Um, I mean, it's clear that phenomena like Al Qaeda and, and Islamic State have produced huge quantities of literature, uh, a lot of it very bad, uh, a lot of it kind of fly by night, and um, absolutely kind of longer trajectory that I think you know, Suzanne is, is actually thinking about in this book. Um, I think what we what we do have that's that the better works until now have since deployed the historian's armory of thinking more seriously about context and the complexity and, and the contingency at least an awareness of it. And we have some kind of micro picture. I mean, it's something actually that Julie said earlier. I think we do have some good micro pictures, and it's perhaps upon that foundation that historians can. As, as this book tries to do, kind of offer it now a kind of more substantive kind of macro view, which is perhaps the thing that has been missing um, until now. So, just my rambling thoughts. <laughs> it's an interesting question from, from Seth about the field since I guess I was thinking more from 9 11 than just from, from ISIS. and. Yeah, I mean, as others have said, like a lot of academic fields, I think it's quite like bloated and like ballooned, and I, I see kind of like a, a tornado like tunnel kind of thing, just a, that's just kind of getting bigger and bigger and swirling upwards. Um, but there's a lot of value within it as well. Um, I think the field is a lot more diverse than it was in 2001 when I think at least a lot of us first started our, our studies and, and work in it. Um, and it's a lot more interdisciplinary than it was. And I think just the central guiding rudder of it is in a better place than it was at that time. I remember the initial conversations in my undergrad after 9-11 were very, you know, very reductive, the, the us versus them, why do they hate us? I mean, that was really where even the scholarly attention was still being written. And I think that has changed to a much more critical, nuanced place. And I think as Suzanne rightly points out, our worldview of what we take is a given in terms of neoliberalism and the state, all that is questioned in a much deeper way um, by academics as well now. So I think it's moving in the right direction, but obviously still a lot of work to go. You want to say something? I was just going to say that the, you know, this book in part was like, Seth, like a, a result of my frustration. Like I, I wanted this to exist in the field of Middle Eastern studies. Um, but it didn't because most of the treatments on the topic, again, were kind of like those backward readings into the genealogy. So it's like we have the Quran and the Sunna, we have the Hadith, we have the Tigmeya, then we have Sayyid Qutb, and like boom, ISIS. Um, and the and and frankly, I had to kind of abandon some of our traditional like disciplinary toolbooks. This is much more a work of global theory than. Um, you know, than it is recognizably a work of like Islamic studies or, or, or Middle East studies. And I think that that is a very, at least I think that's been very productive for, for, for me, um, not like push by it for everybody, but um, to, you know, to 
also to, to encourage people working within the field to be engaging, I think, like Ahmed is exactly right on, yeah, on these questions that maybe are more productively answered at the level of political theory than, say, Islamic studies. Okay. I propose we continue the conversation over refreshments, which Yolanda <laughs> has provided for us outside. So everybody is invited uh, for, for drinks outside. So please do come and join us. Thank you for everyone at home who's uh, been watching, who's been contributing on the chat. It just remains for me to, to thank Suzanne, Ahmed, Martin, and Julie for these wonderful thoughts uh, on your new book. So congratulations, and please come back again soon with the next book. <laughs>